Hello. How are you? Hopefully some more people will filter in. Uh, it's a nice afternoon. <laughs> so um, welcome to our session around clean energy investments. Um, I'm Rob Werner. I'm the state director for the League of Conservation Voters here in New Hampshire. And our idea about this session was to not only provide some information in terms of where all these funds are with the IRA. And by the way, we at LCV are now calling it the Affordable Clean Energy Act. As I like to say when people you talk about IRA with us, why are you talking about my retirement account? What's that have to do with it? So we're calling it something different, which we think is a little more descriptive at this point. Um, so uh, we're not only going to be talking about where all these monies are, what the opportunities are, particularly on the residential consumer side for people to take advantage of all these investments. Because one of the things that uh, I think is important within this world is, you know, we've had um, 300 and uh, you know, almost $300 billion invested in this program, which have uh, leveraged another many more billions of dollars. And now with private investment, you're talking about well over a trillion dollars that has been invested and leveraged. So with all of this, all of these dollars, um, I think people are wanting to know, they're, they're, they're much more aware of it, but they're wanting to know, well, how, how does it help me? How does it improve my life? Why should I even care about it? And some of it, I think, has to do historically with perhaps distrust of, of institutions in which we are unfortunately living in this age. Um, but here's an opportunity where government can be a good partner with people and help people improve their lives. But only if they know about these opportunities and how to, uh, how to get it, take advantage of them, how to leverage them. So that's in part why we're here today. We're going to try a little bit of an experiment today in terms of format. So we're going to have some imparting of information. But then what we'll do is, if people want to know specifically more about particular aspects, whether that's energy efficiency, solar, uh, incentives for EV um, purchasing, financing, you can go to these various stations and talk to those people who know an awful lot about those subjects. So the energy efficiency folks are going to be over there. Uh, financing, Scott Maslansky is going to be over there. Um, Andy and Nora are going to be over there with energy efficiency. Dan Weeks from Revision Energy is going to be over here about solar. And John Condos is going to be over at that table after we do these presentations uh, focusing on EVs. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Elizabeth McKenna from Senator Sheen's office. She has been keeping track of uh, all these funds uh, for quite some time, since the beginning. And Senator Shaheen's office has put together some really good resources in terms of, and, and understandable resources, that's the key, in terms of figuring out how this all works and how people can take advantage of, of these programs. So take it away. Thank you. Um, and thank you for saying it's an understandable format because I try really hard to do that. It's really confusing. There's a lot of information. Um, you know, we're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act today, but the bipartisan infrastructure law that was also passed before um, the IRA also has a lot of uh, clean energy goals and transportation and things that can be coupled really well with the IRA. So um, the administration is working very hard to get all of that money out the door, uh, and you'll see it come fast. Uh, and you know that's because there is a threat on the other side to to take it back. So that is kind of the reason for why it's coming out so fast. And I understand that that could be very overwhelming for communities, especially rural communities. So uh, at something I've worked a goal of mine to make sure that it's digestible and that you uh, and our communities have the information they need on hand. Uh, so for that plug, if you're not from, if you're from New Hampshire, please, please get in touch with me. Uh, if you ever have questions or information, if you're not from New Hampshire, I think your member of Congress actually is a great resource 
um, if you have questions about any of the federal grants. Um, Nora and I were just talking to uh, something your congressional office can do when you're applying for a federal grant is send a letter of support. So just some things to keep in mind um, as you're thinking about uh, grants that are available. <clears throat> uh, and that is my contact information up there. So please uh, reach out with any questions anytime. Uh, so the IRA specifically has expanded, is primarily expanded tax credits. Um, it increased grants that, and programs that already exist. Uh, it also created a rebate program. Uh, who does it benefit? This list is not, ex uh, <laughs> probably doesn't catch everybody, but it benefits individuals, it inventor, uh, renters, homeowners, businesses, nonprofits, state governments, local governments. Um, it, it has a wide reach. Uh, when I, and I'm going to just breeze through some of this. Um, what I have found is that repeating information is helpful. Um, so Andy and Nora are going to go a little bit more in depth on different things. So I just wanted to give you the quick snip. You'll hear more about it. And again, if you have questions, come back. But I, th I think hearing this repeatedly is actually helps sink it in a little bit more. Um, so some of the grants and loans that are available for housing and businesses and others, uh, you may have heard of the REAP grants. Those are through the USDA Rural Development Office. Um, they, that is an existing program that saw an increasing amount of money um, through uh, the IRA. So they, I think I actually heard today that they are going, or yesterday, that they are um, opening those grants on a quarterly basis because they have so much money. So kind of another thing to note there, if you see a grant and it goes by and you missed it, um, don't think that's the end. Some grants are one-time infusion. A lot of them are going to keep opening. Um, so REAP is a really great one. Um, you know, kind of in the agriculture space, uh, NRCS, uh, uh, the Farm Service, all of those folks also have a lot of uh, IRA money that they've purposed into different programs. Um, so if, you're, if that's applicable to you, that's a great um, Reaching out to the, your USDA office would be a great start. Um, there's also some direct loans um, for renewable energy. There is some good money in there from HUD, uh, too, for multifamily um, homes. Uh, I've seen uh, some, some great programs most recently come out of HUD, and I may be speaking out of terms here in terms of its IRA money or regular appropriations, but they just released one um, very recently for... Uh, lead in housing stock um, for communities to apply for so that you can work with your communities for, for uh, lead abatement issues or weatherization issues. They have, it's called their Healthy Homes Grant. Um, so uh, if there's something that you think might be applicable, I found the best thing to do is go to those federal websites and just search their grants. Um, again, you're going to hear more about the rebates, but uh, the rebates was a uh, really important to Senator Shaheen, a bill that she had. Uh, she's long worked on energy efficiency issues, but one of the bills that she had that got passed through the IRA was the Hope for Homes Act. The homes piece of that was the rebates, and the HOPE Act was uh, training grants to help um, bring more workforce into the fold to help um, with weatherization and energy efficiency. So the homes and the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Program will provide rebates to individuals when you purchase energy efficient appliances. Uh, this program is still getting worked out right now um, at the state level. So all of the states are gonna get the money and then they're gonna set up their own programs. Um, this is a brand new program. <laughs> so uh, I ask for patience with your states because they are doing their best to set up something that's brand new and has um, a lot of complications to it, uh, figuring out individuals' income, figuring out how they're gonna work at point of sale. There's a lot to it. Uh, so that is what's, what has taken place in the last year, is working out those details. And then the states are gonna uh, set up a program. So uh, winter is the general timeline that I've heard repeatedly for the states to start uh, setting up a program and then it will be state by state of when you may see those rebates in your own state. Um, so the tax credits is the next uh, significant part of um, 
the IRA and the, you know, you probably have heard a lot about them. Uh, there's tax credits for if you buy a new car, there's tax credits if you want solar in your house. There's a lot for individuals. Um, but I wanted to put this slide up here because this is something that is new that came out of the IRA and it's elective pay. Um, elective pay is, will give non-filing entities the opportunity to apply for um, direct payments back from the IRS. So if you are a nonprofit and you've never applied, you, you don't apply, you don't file taxes, you, there's now a process that will be set up so that you can get a direct payment back to you. Um, and these are the list of tax credits that qualify for elective pay. Um, so again, you're gonna hear more about this, but I just wanted to put that on your radar. If you are a municipality, if you work with a nonprofit, I've heard from a lot of churches um, that are nonprofit. If you're in that nonprofit status, you've never filed your taxes um, because you didn't need to, because you're a nonprofit or a municipality, there's now an option for you to receive a direct payment back for making energy efficiency upgrades. Um, and then uh, I'll just throw the slide up here about some resources for you to gain more information. Um, Rewiring America is uh, providing a lot of great tools and resources for people to see, all right, how much can I get in a tax credit or a rebate? Um, I just plug in my information and then you'll see at the bottom of the screen that's what their tool, their calculator looks like and it will plug in what you may qualify for but then also how you can find out more information about those things. Um, the administration has a landing page, cleanenergy.gov, uh, that I just think is pretty user-friendly and cool. You can click on that car right there and it will tell you about the uh, tax credit for cars. Um, and then if uh, I also frequently check the irs.gov slash inflation reduction act website, so I put that on there as well for you. Constantly, things are getting updated. Um, so that's a great place and to, to keep up to date on what the IRS and Treasury is working on since a lot of the IRA is coming out of Treasury. Um, and then Senator Shaheen has made a federal energy resource guide. That's that QR code there. Didn't want to print off a ton of paper. So um, I hope that QR code works for you. This is my first time making a QR code. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, and so that's there. We have this uh, resource guide that we made last year that is great. We made it with the intention of individual consumers um, who wanted to know more about the IRA, who wanted to know more about energy programs that exist that might be available for them. So there's a lot of information in there about LIHEAP, fuel assistance, and weatherization as well. Um, so that's a good guide to share with folks if they have any questions. Plus, all of the cleanenergy.gov and the Rewiring America links are on there too. So it can just be a good one-stop shop to find all of that above. Um, and then I will turn it back over to you, Rob, for more depth about all the great programs. Sure, thank you. Uh, so next up, uh, we have Andy Duncan. Let me make sure that we get this slide in here correctly. There you go. So, I'm really glad that Andy is joining us. He is a longtime uh, advocate and uh, administrator for clean energy programs. He's worked with the community college system in New Hampshire for many, many years, continues to do so. He's very involved with energy efficiency. Uh, he does things like button-up workshops, which actually he's going to be doing for us in Concord at the end of November. He's very attuned to workforce development issues, which is highly important to the success of all this uh, in terms of these programs and making sure they actually work and it gets delivered to people and in the community. So turn it over to Andy. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, great to be here. I wish I could stick around for the whole conference. I've, I've heard about this conference and it's like, wow, pretty nifty. And uh, I can't help but notice the, uh, the window quilts on these big old windows. It's like, yeah, Keene, City of Keene knows what they're doing. Um, so I, I work, as Rob said, I work at uh, Lake Street Gene Community College. It's part of the community college system. I do a, uh, basically run a sustainable energy training program. It's non-credit type training, so short-term trainings 
can find out more about it at the LRC lrcc.edu. And this isn't, I don't think this is even the whole Inflation Reduction Act, but it just kind of gives you a little flavor of some of the green energy uh, tax credits that are out there. And if you're thinking about a sound bite, you know, I love the, uh, the alternative title that you gave it, Rob, but to me, this is the most significant US climate law ever. And you know, that's a pretty big deal. And so it really, uh, Jean Shaheen, Senator Shaheen, and other senators, and the rest of Congress, at least the ones who were supportive of it, really deserve a pat on the back for, for the work that they're doing, did with this. And we're already one year into it. And um, there's already been about 170,000 new jobs created. Uh, the projections are about 1.5 million new jobs by 2030. And if you're thinking, well, you know, how does this affect me? It's, I mean, maybe I don't work in clean energy. You know, think of it from the perspective of energy consumers. And it's not so much reducing the cost per unit of fuel, but produce, reducing the cost of that bundle uh, of energy that all consumers are having to, to use through efficiency, through renewables, and other, uh, other sources. So I love the phrase, reduce, then produce. So reduce through energy efficiency, produce through solar or other renewable energy. And uh, as Rob mentioned, um, workforce, clean energy workforce, a big part of this whole law. And it's all about living wage jobs. So organized labor is um, very much featured with this law and apprenticeship opportunities I'll talk about in just a minute. Made in America, prevailing wages, Justice 40. How many of you are familiar with the Justice 40 initiative? So at least a decent chunk of you. It's a Biden administra administration, kind of administration-wide initiative, but it's particularly relevant for these laws to go after um, helping out uh, disadvantaged communities. So really important, particularly if you're associated with a disadvantaged community or population, to recognize that there's some great uh, opportunities there. But you know, uh, I took a look at the uh, unemployment rate for New Hampshire, and I had to do a double take, 1.8% unemployment rate? You know, that's just like, that's nobody. Uh, so we have a little bit of a challenge uh, right now in terms of a labor market. And so we're trying to add these jobs, we're trying to do things in terms of clean energy. It's that, that is, is, you know, is the glass half full or half empty? It's, it's a challenge. It's exciting, but it's also daunting. And I do ask the question, are traditional educational workforce systems prepared for this clean energy workforce tidal wave? And I'm part of one of those fairly traditional uh, community college systems, and I, and I wonder sometimes. So we, we've got some work to do. And just a great resource if you're wondering kind of like who is doing this sort of work, what sort of jobs are out there. The uh, IREC, which is the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, puts out this green buildings career map. And it, it lists 55 different types of job positions. And then there's a solar career map with 40 different types of job positions. And then there's a climate control technology career map. So that's heating, ventilation, air conditioning, controls, refrigeration, 40 different types of job positions right there. So lots of different job positions. It's not a one size fit all. Um, and that's just in kind of more on the, the buildings installation side. That doesn't even count manufacturing, EVs, other things like that. So it, we're really talking about kind of a major retooling of our whole economy, particularly the energy sector of it. And I do want to emphasize apprenticeships. Uh, great soundbite there is earn as you learn. So this is primarily aimed at kind of entry level workers who might be just starting out. And the whole idea there is that there's on the job learning that's really important. And then there's also um, what's called um, uh, the, basically the kind of structured training that's, that's part of it. And, and there's an apprenticeship New Hampshire program that's part of the community college system. And uh, if you're curious about one state that's kind of really kind of going after that in a big way, New Hampshire's gotten a number of US Department of Labor grants for that. So that apprenticeshipnh.com is uh, actually part of the community college system. So just a couple IRA kind of tidbits that might be of interest. Um, there is a pretty nice 30% tax credit for wood stoves, pellet stoves, efficient uh, wood boilers, pellet boilers, things like that. And that includes installation costs. 
it is capped, I think, at $2,000. But here in New Hampshire, wood economy, forestry economy is really important. And so that is something to, to consider. Also, the geothermal, so the ground source heat pumps, get that 30% tax credit, which I don't think has a cap. And that's something to keep in mind as well. The air source heat pumps do not have as nice uh, a tax credit. There's a cap, 30%, but there's a cap. And then um, energy efficiency conservation block grants. Uh, talk with Dory if you want to know about small communities and energy efficiency conservation block grants. But this is kind of more at the state level with the larger communities like Keene. Um, that's $550 million, you know, kind of small compared to the whole amount of the Inflation Reduction Act. But that can be important money kind of flowing down into communities. And uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, there is a state-based home energy efficiency contractor training grants that are flowing to state energy offices. Uh, and those are important in terms of getting those uh, residential rebate programs going. And uh, as Elizabeth mentioned as well, there is this Rural Energy for America program. What's uh, worth knowing about those with the small business grants, this is on top of the tax credits, and it's a 50% grant for eligible energy efficiency and solar projects. But that's only through their quarterly windows, only through uh, basically a year from now. So if you know any small businesses, Basically, any small business around here in good chunks of, of uh, rural the U.S. would be eligible for those grants. And they do have a wood heat uh, grant program, but it's at a lesser amount. And um, just real quickly, New Hampshire Rural Renewables is a Lakes Region Community College program where we provide no-cost technical assistance for uh, those small businesses. And it's not necessarily just for the REAP grants. It can be for other things. I don't have time to kind of talk about all this. I'd be glad to talk about this at the station, but there are these energy efficiency tax credits. There's the home efficiency rebates. Uh, and then there's the, the HERE program, the electrification or electrification appliance rebates. This is all at the residential level. This is kind of what's coming down the pike that's gonna be implemented by the state energy offices and glad to talk more uh, at the station about those coming up. And now I'll... Pass it on to Rob and to Nora. I think you had a question, but can you just hold that? And, we'll, and then we'll do Q&A after this last uh, important presentation. Thanks. So um, uh, Nora Hanke is the uh, pro program manager at Adnox Sustainability Hub, uh, which is a long time, organ it's a long standing organization here in the region that really has promoted regional collaboration and done great work around uh, promoting a clean energy economy. And uh, she's going to be our final presenter. Hold on. There we go. Hello, my name is Nora Hanka. I'm the program manager at Monadnock Sustainability Hub. We are a grassroots nonprofit that serves the 34 towns of southwest New Hampshire. Our mission is to hasten the transition of our region to 100% renewable energy. And our, our model of um, action is by collaborating with others. So my little piece of this panel will be talking primarily about residential electrification incentives, also residential clean energy systems, and um, personal use electric vehicle and charger incentives. But I'll also touch on the um, applicability of some of these incentives for businesses and for non-taxable entities. So kind of picking up from um, energy efficiency, the next stage um, to consider is uh, electrification and energy systems in the home. Currently uh, in this realm, what we have available are tax credits and they will continue for uh, you know, 10 to 12 years depending on the exact program. Um, the amount of the tax credit that you can claim depends on your tax appetite, meaning that you cannot claim more than you owe in federal taxes for that year. The rebate programs will start, as um, Elizabeth mentioned, probably sometime this winter. Um, New Hampshire is probably going to be on the early side of that curve nationwide because we're one of the earlier states to ask for and receive the allocation. 
and there are four states that are non-participating. The way these programs will look um, will vary a little bit from state to state because each state will have some criteria that they will um, create for their implementation rollout. And the purpose of these incentives is to help residences purchase and install um, high efficiency appliances, especially ones that replace um, fossil fuel technology and technologies that allow clean energy generation. In most cases, these incentives will reset each tax year. So the electrification appliance rebates um, can be good for up to $14,000 for a household that's in the low to moderate income category. And the exact figures um, are yet to be determined because there's different criteria for those. But basically, it is uh, the, defined by um, low income is under 80% um, of area median income. And low to moderate is 80 to 150% of area median income. And the, the, the area is usually defined by a census tract. So for those who are in the low income category, no, there will be no expenditure required. And those in the moderate income category will get 50%, uh, up to 50% of the project cost um, rebated. However, those who are in the high income categories will not be able to participate in these incentives. Um, residential clean energy generation and storage is another category that's going to be allowed through um, both the tax um, credits um, and th through the tax credits primarily. And these um, apply to solar systems for um, rooftop solar and solar water heaters, also for um, geothermal, biomass, and small wind turbine systems. In the case of solar and geothermal, as well as batteries, there actually is no cap on um, whatever the figure is that you get from 30% times project cost. But for the other ones, there is a cap of, um, as Andy mentioned, $2,000 for biomass, for example, and air source heat pumps. These will apply to um, both existing homes and new construction, um, but this category will not apply to rentals. People who rent are also able to access some of these incentives because people who rent can actually um, purchase and bring with them some appliances that are used in the home. And these will include things like um, cooktops that can replace an inefficient um, electric coil uh, range. It can include, um, you know, for those who are responsible for their own washing and drying machines, um, efficient qualifying washers and dryers. Um, and also, um, once the, st the standards um, for efficiency have been established for window insert um, heat pumps, then those will also be applicable for this incentive for um, tenants who also can use the EV incentives. The other category of um, bet potential benefit for people who rent is that um, if they know that they're in a the, the low income category and that in their building um, at least 50% of the tenants or the households have low income, then that landlord, if they have like skin in the game because they're paying, for example, heat for the apartments, they might be incentivized to um, participate um, with, um, because it, it, there are advantages for doing so when you have low income tenants. Whether it's gonna be exactly 50% of tenants or more than 50% will depend on the state rollout. Some of these incentives also apply for businesses and tax exempt entities, in particular the um, clean energy um, generation projects. And it starts at a, at a base of 6% um, rebate for the project cost. But depending on fulfilling other criteria, for example, labor standards, um, whether or not apprentices are involved, et cetera, it can actually um, be up to 30% of project cost that is rebated. And in the form um, of tax credit for businesses, because they are tax filers, but for those who don't normally pay tax, they will have to pay um, the money for the project up front the same way the businesses. However, they will be able to um, get it paid back to them uh, if they follow the, the IRS filing, limit, filing guidelines um, and, and, and the particular paperwork with the deadlines being met. There's another category of incentive that um, applies to residences, um, and this is, these are electric vehicles. And you think, well, you know, why should I care about an electric vehicle? Well, if you, if you want to have personal transportation, these are much better than gas cars. They, um, first of all, they save you a ton of money over the, cycle, the life cycle of the vehicle compared to the gas car. They are, you know, for people who like technology, they are three times more efficient than gas cars. Um, they will have a significant benefit for pollution levels in our communities, both um, air pollution um, and noise pollution, and they're fun to drive. 
So in the case of um, um, the different categories of vehicle, um, for new cars, which tend to have batteries that with a longer range, um, they, um, and they tend to cost more, these might be um, more attractive to someone who has a long commute, whose current vehicle is extremely inefficient, um, or is near end of life. Um, the other um, group might be people who are excellent candidates right now for a used car. These are people who don't necessarily need to have a lot of range for their daily driving because they have a short commute. Um, older cars may have um, some loss of battery, battery um, functioning. They also tend to have, um, initially when they were first rolled out, uh, a lower range than the newer cars. Um, if you can find a used EV and, and you're in that category, that might be a really good choice for you now. But in both cases, whether it's a new used um, EV or battery electric vehicle, because, uh, sorry, hybrid um, uh, vehicle, they also um, will require charging. And so you want to make sure you can either install home charging or you have access to public charging. It could be at your workplace or, or it could be available in your town. You know, another factor to consider if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, which category you want, um, some um, communities have a real difficult time getting uh, car dealers to want to sell EVs. Um, new EVs, um, and if you're having to order a, a car, depending on the model you're interested in, it may be um, available now within a few months or over a year. So there are significant incentives for both um, used um, and new EVs, and for a new EV, the amount of the incentive can be up to 7,500. Again, this depends on your tax appetite. You cannot have an incentive um, applied to you that is more than you owe that year in taxes. The um, incentive is expected to transfer, translate into an upfront discount at the point of purchase in 2024. The dealership would have to be participating in that. Um, if you want to buy a vehicle from um, an eligible vehicle from a dealership that's not participating, then you'll actually have to file the paperwork yourself. Um, there are some um, owner income criteria. Um, it has to be for your personal use. And the, um, the year the incentive is claimed is the year in which you obtained the vehicle. Um, not the, when you ordered it, but when you actually take possession. And there are some price um, um, categories. So unless the vehicle is under 55,000 for um, a smaller car or for SUVs um, and um, a larger cars under 80,000 for manufacturer suggested price, um, they won't you know, be eligible, so the really high-end vehicles, there's no incentive. There are some um, assembly and um, component requirements as well. The, the criteria that exists this year will actually get more strict in coming years, and so we don't actually know which vehicles will qualify next year. We only know currently which vehicles qualify this year. And I don't want you to be overwhelmed by this, car, this table, but I wanted you to see that, that the currently uh, the current new EVs that are eligible for incentives break down into either $3,700, $750 incentive or $7,500, again, depending on your tax appetite for that calendar year. And there are quite a few different brands and a bunch of different um, models, model years, and we don't know exactly which ones of these will be um, also fulfilling the criteria that apply next year. Used EVs are also eligible for incentives, and um, your income limits are lower for this category. The um, person who wishes to claim a used EV credit cannot have claimed a clean vehicle credit within the previous three years, and the vehicle must be purchased at a um, dealership for no more than $25,000. A given vehicle also only um, can receive a used vehicle credit or you know, be associated with new vehicle credit once. Um, so it can't continuously be resold to keep generating credits for the new buyers. Uh, to just give you an idea of, you know, how hard is it to get one of these cars? Um, I did a search for the used um, EV dealer that we have in New Hampshire. It's in Northampton. Um, I put in the criteria of um, less than or equal to 25,000, and they currently have 17 vehicles in that category. So that's, that's pretty good. Another option, which is kind of sneaky because there's some loopholes here, um, is for leasing an EV. And the reason I say um, you know, sneaky and loopholes is that there are many cars that do not qualify for the, um, the new EV credit, um, even though they may be within the price ranges of under 55000 or under 80000 for a manufacturer's suggested price, um, because maybe the mineral components or the, the location of final assembly. Um, if those vehicles are available for lease, 
then the, um, the leasing business may actually be able to access the incentive because that requirement, those requirements for mineral assemb and assembly don't, do not apply for commercial entities um, to access the incentive. And if they um, get the incentive and if they will pass it on to you, then a sneaky way of getting a vehicle that perhaps you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise but you know you really, really want is to lease it and then immediately buy it out. So another aspect of, of having an EV is, is to be able to charge it. A lot of new vehicle sales come with chargers and installation as part of the deal. Um, there are some states and utilities that offer incentives. In our state, I believe the only utility that's currently doing so is New Hampshire Electric Co-op. For most parts of our state, um, there is a tax credit that um, applies for 30% um, of your installation costs, so the buying and installation of the charger for, um, for up to $1,000. If, if you live in a metropolitan area, which is kind of like Nashua type of deal, um, no one in the Monadnock region would, is considered to be um, metropolitan, so we would all be able to access this as rural. Um, if you are a business and you're install, installing chargers, perhaps for your workers or for your clients, then you're eligible for a higher amount of um, credit. Though there are also additional criteria to be met. And some of these EV incentives apply for municipalities and other non-tax entities. In particular, these have to be new vehicles. Um, and again, you have to pay um, the you have to pay the money, but you you file um, and then you can get the rebate back. There are um, later, greater amounts of refund available for those who um, are buying a, a medium or heavy-duty truck, municipalities or um, businesses. And this is an example of, I believe, the Wolfboro um, Municipal Police Department, EV. So it's kind of overwhelming. There's a lot to think about. Um, I want to, want to make you understand that this is all part of an ecosystem that's pre-existing. We, we already have incentives available to us um, in New Hampshire. It's called New Hampshire Saves um, and the Weatherization Assistance Programs and LIHEAP, both available through the um, local community action agencies. If you have a lower income, then you go through that system. Uh, anyone who wants to check out their, their home's eligibility for home performance with Energy Star can easily do so on the website. About 90% of people who put their data in there find that they qualify for services. These are massively discounted services. Um, if you don't qualify for that, or if you qualify but perhaps they've, they've um, met their quota for the year and they can't serve you again until 2024, you might want to, um, again, if you're a homeowner, invest just that small amount of money in having a home energy audit performed. Um, you will be able to get a tax credit of $150 for this calendar year or next, for example. And that helps you understand what, what's the low-hanging fruit, you know, what is you know, most important to tackle. Then you can think about, you know, what, what do I have in the home um, that's, that's not very efficient or perhaps is unhealthy. Um, gas stoves and um, fossil fuel heating systems are unhealthy. They cause indoor air pollution. They significantly increase asthma in children. They increase our risk of cardiovascular disease. They, they exacerbate um, existing illness um, in those um, parts of the body. So we also want to think about which, which tax um, category we fit into. If, um, if we know that we're going to be um, eligible for the, the rebate programs um, that roll out next year, then we might want to um, hold off a little bit on some of the projects. But if you're make, making more than 150% of area median income, then just jump in and start to um, generate your tax credits with, with the appropriate projects for your home. A lot of these incentives are stackable. You cannot combine the two different federal programs, but you can combine the federal programs with some of the state programs and the utility programs with the state programs. Um, you can't get the same dollar back twice but you can get it back once, um, so that's really nice to know. I'd also encourage people to um, become informed about EVs if you might be on the market for one. Uh, we have a drive electrics um, all over the state at least twice a year. There's one um, in P Peterborough as part of the Monadnock Energy Fair this Saturday. Um, the fair is from 10 to 2 in Peterborough at the community center. There's other ones throughout the state as well. This is a really good way of seeing a bunch of EVs at once and talking with owners. So what I also encourage you to do is to really think about um, what a plan could be for you. And um, absolutely excellent tool that Elizabeth mentioned is the Rewiring America calculator. I think that if you're going to go to only one website, one URL, that's the one to go to. You plug in um, your zip code. It knows what census tract you are. You put your income in. It knows you know, how you fit for area median income. It's going to immediately tell you 
you know, what, what you are eligible for and help suggest um, a plan for what to do in what order. Gives you lots of um, links to the federal um, websites that tell you the up-to-date information about claiming um, incentives and, and when things roll out. I would encourage you to talk about what you want to do and what you are doing with the people that you know and to consider um, sharing it more widely in your community, maybe having an event at your library or at your school. Um, if you want to really go gung-ho for this, then there's a program through Rewiring America to become an electrification coach. It's a series of, I think, three or four two-hour sessions plus homework in between where you really learn nitty-gritty about this and you, to really be able to spread it in your community. And these, this is uh, reiterating some of the resources that other um, presenters have given you. Um, again, there's a, a lot to think about. Um, the Rewiring America Calculator is a really great starting point. And I'll be with Andy over in that corner if you have any specific questions that we don't talk about in our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thanks to all of our presenters. As you can see, this is a pretty complex project we're talking about. And this legislation was passed just over a year ago. And this year really has been a transition year in terms of so many of the agencies writing their rules and putting specifics in terms of how all this is going to be implemented. So I really think that this coming year, 2024, is, is really going to be the year when all of this becomes real, available on the ground. The other thing I want to point out that was a real benefit of this legislation is the time horizon, 10 years. That's not only helpful for individuals in terms of their planning, but it's, an, it's very helpful to the business community. Because the business community, probably more than anything else, wants some certainty some predictability, uh, and obviously the sort of incentives and investments that are leveraged in the private market by these federal in, uh, resources and investments, as we talked about at the top, are very significant. So it's, it's a real blessing in terms of this program, the length of time that it has in terms of the horizon for people and businesses and our society to take advantage of it. So uh, next year, uh, 2024, is really going to be, I think, proof in the pudding in terms of operation on the ground and how it's working. And we know adjustments will be made in terms of what the experience is. So but please pay attention to all of that. Um, we're going to have a couple minutes for questions. And then if you want to know more specifics about, for example, I don't really know a lot about heat pumps. I want to get one. How does that all work with the tax incentives? We're going to have energy efficiency over in that corner. Uh, and then in terms of financing, both uh, more so in terms of businesses, but also some individual aspects. Uh, Scott Maslansky from CDFA is going to be over there. Um, if you want to learn more specifics about the solar incentives, uh, Dan Weeks from Revision Energy is going to be over there. And then you see John Kondo sitting over there. He's very. Um, knowledgeable about EVs and exactly what models um, are of, of um, automobiles are eligible now and how, how this is all going to work. He's been very involved over the years in terms of drive electric programs. So I know there's a question back here to start off with. Um, what's that? <laughs> On the IRE GEMS, it had on the slide, it said a wood credit of 25%. Does that include pellets? We have a so, pellet so manufacturing. What it includes is uh, wood stoves, pellet stoves, pellet boilers, uh, but they need to meet certain criteria. The US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, came out with a list of stoves that meet certain uh, pollution generation and efficiency criteria. So those essentially have to be on that list. and the. The biomass industry is kind of known about those standards. It was kind of like, it's going to come, it's going to come, it's going to come. So they, they certainly know about it. Uh, and most manufacturers have been able to put out models that, that meet that. And then I'll point out in New Hampshire, it, both commercial and residential level, if you purchase a, um, it has to be bulk fed wood pellet boiler system, there is a very generous 40% uh, rebate in addition to that federal tax credit. And the federal, unfortunately, 
the federal tax credit only applies to residential and doesn't apply to commercial installations, but the, uh, the wood pellet boiler applies to both in New Hampshire. That is just New Hampshire, but there could be other states that have something similar to that. I, I don't know offhand. So this is kind of a follow-up, but not with, with um, wood heat, but with heat pumps. Somebody was asking me yesterday, and I didn't know the answer, if there were criteria for which heat pumps would be eligible for the both rebate and tax credits. Yeah, there are criteria. And um, I think that actually just changed the whole criteria uh, kind of scheme in 2023. So that of is, course. is changing. <laughs> but the uh, Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, I think, NEEP, they have a really excellent website about heat pumps. And you can look them up in terms of efficiency uh, model by model. And even they'll show what their efficiency is at like zero or five degrees, which is really handy to see. I think the NH Saves website may also specify some particular models and what the standards are that need to be met. And that might be the case for other states' um, utility programs. Um, we don't quite know whether these, you know, um, federal incentives, the rebate programs, will roll out, um, you know, through the state departments of energy or through the state utility programs or some other, you know, mechanism. But um, it would be easier to adapt the existing utility programs than for a Department of Energy in a state to suddenly devise a new. So that's kind of what we're thinking, and it's going to probably happen in New Hampshire is the NH Saves is going to be administering it. And so they are a good source for what qualifies. I had a quick question uh, in a similar vein about the, um, the mechanism by which the EV um, brand model, battery, and mineral sourcing, how that's determined. Is that's by EPA, and is that by like an advisory committee, or is that through, um, yeah, how's that done? Yeah, I'm not sure um, if the initial legislation specified the, um, you know, um, exact percentage, percents of, you know, battery mineral, uh, battery and mineral components um, and final assembly, but, but the IRS has that guidance now. And so when it's a new vehicle, um, there, there's a very easy list on the um, IRS website, which tells you which models for, you know, last year and this year. Be, um, and I, and I, sometimes I don't know if you can put in 2024 yet, but probably you could because it's September. Um, which vehicles will qualify for the um, all electric and the plug in hybrid um, clean vehicle credits? Um, and so you can look it up now for, for purchase this year, but because the numbers go up next year for how many, how much of the battery has to be from there and whether or not there's allowed to be anything from China in the car, um, we don't have that, those rules yet um, for, for purchase in 2024. So the other, the other aspect of, of looking it up besides just putting it in, um, you know, for that, you know, brand and make and year is that there's a VIN lookup. So if the car exists yet, if it's been made, then it has a VIN, um, and you can put the VIN into the VIN lookup tool at the IRS website, and it will tell you if that car qualif qualifies or not, and, and whether it's the 3,750 or the 7,500. Seems like there's a bigger conversation starting to happen around the sourcing and mining and policies that are coming out of that. So IRS is um, talking about the, the rebates, but I guess I also, and I can follow up, follow up, um, but just am interested from a policy perspective. Um, and that goes to like bigger question of is the IRA like uh, vulnerable to political change? Yeah, I don't actually know, um, you know, much about which countries are currently considered to be, you know, friends and enemies and this and that for the purposes of these car criteria. Maybe Elizabeth, do you know that? Well, I, I know. I mean, China. That's China's the big question, but I don't know if it's currently considered to be in the <coughs> bad kid box or whether it's going to be put there. Yeah, that's a great. You, you raise a great question. Um, a big part, and I, I can't answer it specifically, um, but a big part of all of um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, 
is supporting American workers. Um, that's why we have the Build America, Buy America provisions. That's why we want cars that are manufacturing here in, New in um, America, uh, and we're supporting our local economies and our local workers um, and our union workers. So uh, I, you know, I think that there are some circumstances in across all all these federal programs that we're not quite there yet um, because we're building up those resources. Um, NIST uh, has a tool, which is a federal agency through commerce. They have a tool that can help people source um, products. So if you have a federal grant and you need to be BABA requirement and you're looking for, let's say, LED light bulbs, and you can go on their website and you can search what that product is that you're looking for, um, and they'll help you source it and find it. And then uh, if it doesn't exist, they can put in federal language because federal language is slightly different than human language, I think. <laughs> um, that it's not available for you to submit that with your application as a for a waiver request. Um, and so I think that there are circumstances where there have been waivers um, and that the administration understands that in order for this money to be successful, we need to have both. But the ultimate goal here is for, uh, we support American workers and we want American manufacturing. So I know that doesn't get to your question specifically about political of mining and that goes way over my head. Um, but I hope that you check out that NIST tool if you're in that predicament of where do I find this? Because when you're looking at federal grants and you, you just say, I went to my hardware store and they didn't have American made LED light bulbs, um, that's not enough homework. Uh, they want to see that you really sourced and looked to support American workers. Great. Right, well, thanks. Um, why don't we break into the sessions, uh, dig more deep, a uh, little more deeper. Again, energy efficiency, financing, solar, and EVs over there. So thank you all for uh, imparting all of this information and expertise. More to come. Thank you.